Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing pathological cardiac hypertrophy. Okay, so uh, we've discussed what happens in uh, pathological cardiac hypertrophy now. Uh, the cardiomyocytes go from having their normal structure to having a much thickened structure, and this initially helps the uh, wall of um, the heart to produce a greater force of contraction. However, in the long run, it's going to lead to um, loss of um, contractility. So let me discuss that now. So, in the long run, what's going to happen is that these cardiomyocytes, which have hypertrophied like this, uh, they are going to lose their ability to contract with as much force. What I mean by that is we know that what happens inside a cardiomyocyte is that you get a calcium signal. So calcium goes up inside the cytoplasm of the cardiomyocyte, and that then causes contraction, and the cardiomyocyte will generate a certain amount of force. Okay, right. Now, if you have the same rise in calcium within this larger cardiomyocyte, this hypertrophied cardiomyocyte, so i.e. if I measure concentration of calcium in, this, uh, in the cytoplasm of this hypertrophied cardiomyocyte, then the elevation in calcium concentration within this hypertrophied cardiomyocyte will be the same as the elevation in calcium in the non-hypertrophied cardiomyocyte. The actual amount of contraction and the amount of force that you will get for that same, exact same calcium signal is going to be less. That's what I mean by the contractility of these um, hypertrophied cardiomyocytes is reduced. So contractility is reduced. So the amount of force that uh, the cardiomyocyte is capable of generating in response to a certain calcium signal uh, is reduced. Okay, and that's in the long run. In the short run, they will generate more force, but in the long run, what happens is these uh, cardiomyocytes uh, stop uh, contracting with as much force. Now, uh, what you find, basically, is that if we study these hypertrophied cardiomyocytes, there are all sorts of disturbances to their uh, signaling machinery, basically. So the machinery that's involved in the excitation contraction coupling, there's all sorts of uh, things that are wrong with that, generally. Okay, and we don't know really whether uh, these uh, things that are wrong with the excitation contraction coupling machinery, whether that is the cause of the hypertrophy, i.e. whether this cell initially gets problems with the calcium signaling and then goes on to have this hypertrophied appearance, or whether it's the cell becomes hypertrophied and then that causes the change in the uh, calcium signaling machinery. All we know is that uh, these hypertrophied cardiomyocytes do have disturbed calcium signaling, which we'll look at in upcoming videos. Okay, uh, so it's hard to study, basically, um, cardiopathology like this because you need human tissue to do this on, and you can only get human tissue, basically, when uh, either the person suffering has died, or when they've had the heart removed uh, in a heart transplant, okay? Um, and people who have either died or um, had their heart removed in a heart transplant, generally, they will be on drugs, anti um, heart failure drugs um, for a very long time, so it's difficult to know whether what you are studying is the effect of the original pathology or whether it's the effect of the pharmacology, the pharmacological interventions. So it's difficult to know what you're actually seeing. It's very difficult, therefore, to get um, actual tissue which is untreated. So you can use rodent models, of course, but then there's the question of whether the rodent model is actually a good model for the human disease. Okay, so 
The last thing I want to talk about in general uh, with regards to this pathological cardiac hypertrophy before we go on in upcoming videos in this playlist to look at the specifics of what happens to the calcium signaling machinery is the fact that not only do these hypertrophied cardiomyocytes show a lower contractility to a certain calcium signal, they also show a reduced response to stimulation of the beta-1 receptors. So we know that uh, cardiomyocytes have beta-1 adrenergic receptors on their cell surface membranes. So let's draw one of these here. So here's our beta-1 uh, adrenergic receptor, a sort of archetypal example of a G protein coupled receptor. So this is our beta-1 adrenergic receptor bar. <laughs> okay, right. Um, and the sympathetic nervous system through the cardiac nerves releases noradrenaline onto the heart in fight or flight situations. And this noradrenaline acting through beta-1 adrenergic receptors increases the force with which the cardiomyocytes contract. And I'll just remind you of how it increases the force with which the cardiomyocytes contract. So, the beta-1 adrenergic receptor is coupled to the GS heterotrimeric G protein. Okay? And it being a GS heterotrimeric G protein means that this alpha subunit of the heterotrimeric G protein is an alpha S subunit. Okay, so this subunit here is the alpha S subunit, and then we don't know what the beta and the gamma subunits are. So when you're building heterotrimeric G proteins, there are, there's a huge number of ways that you can do this. So in the human genome, there's 16 alpha subunits you can use, there's 5 beta subunits you can use, and there's 12 different gamma subunits you can use. So there are a huge number of heterotrimeric G proteins you can use. But the overall G protein is named after which alpha subunit you use. So if your heterotrimeric G protein is GS, then it means uh, that the alpha subunit is the alpha S subunit. Now, G proteins have two states. They have an on state and an off state. In the off state, they are bound to GDP, and in the on state, they are bound to GTP. So originally, the GS heterotrimeric G protein will be in the off state bound to GDP, guanosine diphosphate. Okay, uh, now, when the noradrenaline comes along, so here comes noradrenaline, which will denote NA, okay, uh, it will bind to the beta-1 adrenergic receptor, and uh, this beta-1 adrenergic receptor will gain catalytic activity, and it will chop off the guanosine diphosphate molecule from the alpha-S subunit, and then it will take a guanosine triphosphate, GTP, molecule from the cytoplasm of the cardiomyocyte, and it will bind that GTP to the alpha S subunit. Now, once you've got an alpha S subunit bound to GTP, it no longer wants to associate with the beta and the gamma subunits. So you get this alpha S with its GTP going off on its own, and it cleaves away from the beta and the gamma subunit. The beta and the gamma remain bound to one another, but they're no longer bound to our alpha S GTP subunit. Okay, so the G protein has split into two portions then. Okay, now, what the alpha S GTP is going to do is it's going to activate an enzyme in the, mem in the uh, cell membrane known as adenylyl cyclase. So let me draw the structure of adenylyl cyclase here. So here's the phospholipid bilayer. The structure of adenylyl cyclase looks something like this. Here's the polypeptide and it spans the membrane in these two membrane-spanning domains here. So each of these transmembrane regions has six membrane-spanning alpha helices. So this is the first transmembrane region, TM1, and this is the second transmembrane region, TM2. Here's the amino terminus of the polypeptide. Here's the carboxylic acid terminus of the polypeptide. Okay, now there's two important domains on an adenylyl cyclase enzyme. The C1 loop, which is this loop between the TM1 and the TM2 domains. And C1 can be divided further into two separate portions. It can be divided into C1A and C1B. And then C2 is this portion 
uh, this carboxylic acid, well, the carboxyl tail, if you like, the portion after TM2, which is on the cytosolic side, and this is called C2, but again, it can be divided up into C2A and C2B. Now, uh, the important uh, portions of the actual enzyme are this C1A portion and the C2A portion. So, in order to actually make an active adenylylcyclase enzyme, what you have to do is bring this C1A portion here together with the C2A portion, and when they dimerize, that will form the active adenylylcyclase. So, what this alpha SGTP complex here does is it binds to both the C1 uh, loop and the C2 portion and uh, brings them close together so that the C1A portion can dimerize with the C2A portion, producing us an active enzyme. Okay, and the forms of the adenylylcyclase enzyme that you have in uh, cardiomyocytes are the adenylylcyclase 5 enzyme, often abbreviated to AC5, and you also have adenylylcyclase 6. So there are nine different uh, known isoforms of um, adenylylcyclase. So these are the specific variants that are expressed in cardiomyocytes. Okay, right. Uh, next up then. So, what does this enzyme do? So, it's been activated by the alpha SGTP subunit, which promotes the dimerization between the C1A and the C2A portions. Now, what it's going to do is it's going to take in adenosine triphosphate, ATP, and it's going to start converting it into cyclic AMP and inorganic phosphate. So, basically, uh, oh, sorry, not inorganic phosphate. Whoops, big mistake there. It's going to start converting it to cyclic AMP and pyrophosphate, PPI. Okay, uh, so this is not inorganic phosphate. This is pyrophosphate, which is two phosphate groups bound together by a, um, a phosphate ester link, I would imagine it's called. I don't actually know whether it's called a phosphate ester link. I should look that up. Um, but I know when you've got a phosphate group linked to an alcohol group, that's a phosphoester link. Um, but whether we, when you've got two phosphate groups linked together like that, it's almost similar to a um, acid um, acid anhydride. Um, never mind. Anyway, uh, pyrophosphate then two phosphate groups linked together. The important thing, however, is not the pyrophosphate; it's the cyclic adenosine monophosphate here. So we're going to elevate the levels of cyclic AMP within the cytoplasm of the cell, but it's more complicated than that. Uh, the dynamics of this are more complicated. What we know is that in cardiomyocytes, what is happening, you are continuously getting action potentials firing, basically, that are coming from the sinoatrial node. So what is actually oscillating within the cytoplasm of the cardiomyocyte, however, is the calcium level. And we know it's oscillating because of the action potentials. But if we have our cardiomyocyte here, we know that the calcium levels within that cardiomyocyte are not uh, at some fixed level. Instead, what's happening, if we plot calcium level against time here, so this is calcium concentration, versus time, and if we just pick some spot and measure calcium concentration there, what we'll see is calcium concentration will initially be very low, and then you'll get a spike, and then it'll come back down, then you'll wait a little bit, you'll get another spike, okay, and this is every time the heart beats, basically. So when the heart beats, uh, action potential will come into the cardiomyocyte, it'll cause the release of the calcium from the SR, calcium level will go up, and then it will um, terminate the calcium signal once the action potential is passed, and then when another action potential comes, you'll get another calcium signal. Now, basically, the cyclic AMP level uh, also oscillates out of phase with this calcium oscillation, and we'll continue this discussion in the next video.